or not. All right. Well, um, I am delighted to be introducing a good friend, Susan Pfeiffer, who is speaking us, to us today, although she is a member of senior college, a member emerita professor, uh, she's speaking to us today from Baltimore through the uh, through the miracle of Zoom, Baltimore, which is Cicada Central. So if you hear any whining noises in the background, that will be a couple that got in when she was showing us shortly ago what they look like on her balcony. Uh, many of us will remember her as the graduate dean uh, in the early 2000s. And some of those of us who were at the book club discussion of ancient DNA earlier in this uh, Season will remember her as our guy, expert guide uh, through that conversation. Um, her research in biological anthropology is, as I summarize it in my non biological anthropology way, it's about what we can learn about ancient humans, how they lived, and what they ate from studying their bones and teeth. And believe me, from having heard her talk, it's amazing what can be learned and what you'll probably find out. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Good. Um, okay, she's had many awards, professional awards and teaching awards. Um, her research and that of her students has mainly has focused on South Africa, where she, she is a research associate of the Department of, of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town and also on the indigenous people of the Lower Great Lakes. She was chair of the committee at U of T, uh, charged with repatriating to the Huron Wendat the bones of 1700 ancestors that were held in various university museums. Uh, and they were successfully repatriated to the Huron Wendat through um, an amazing collaboration. Um, she's going to talk to us to go about some more general issues that are um, surrounding repatriation, which will be uh, discussed in her forthcoming book, Osteobiology. I have to read this. Osteobiology, the discovery, interpretation, and repatriation of human remains. Um, she's well aware that that uh, issue is uh, really has been front and center in some of the news here recently and she'll be happy to answer questions about that and the Huron Wendat project in the question time. So Susan over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I will now um, work on the share my screen part there we, oops, there we go. Share, there we go. Um, so I'll spend a few moments going through some slides and I hope very much that it won't, that I've timed this properly. It's always difficult to know, but my intention is to provide some talking points about the handling of human remains does and does not pair parallel, the handling of curated objects. And my arguments, I'm making two central arguments. One is that the repatriation or restitution of human remains should be integrated into the policy and guidance documents that direct the return of objects. And the second argument is that scientific documentation of human remains is crucial to the process of returning the dignity of those people represented by those bones. So, um, oops, oh, there we go. This is a general outline of where I'm going. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about what I do, and then I'll give you some case studies of objects and bones, and then move into a discussion of what I think needs to happen. So what is bioarchaeology? It's the scientific study of human remains within their archeological context. And I want to give you just a couple of examples of the sorts of tools that can be used 
On this slide, on the left-hand side, is a diagram of one, perhaps the best, of the methods for estimating rather precisely how old someone was, was when they died from the development of their teeth. And this teeth are a wonderful tool for estimating age at death. The other side of the slide illustrates some of the many things that we look at on a human skeleton to get some idea about the quality of life of that person. And those tools include looking at things like dental caries and tooth loss and uh, structural problems with the enamel called enamel hypoplasia that re reflect problems with health while the tooth was forming, the robustness of the skeletal shafts to indicate load bearing, degenerative joint diseases, forms of anemia, traumatic injuries, and responses of the bone to infectious processes. One of the most wonderful things about uh, bioarchaeology is that it gives us access to teeth. Teeth are just the greatest thing. And I want to emphasize briefly some of the things that we can do with just a single tooth. A single tooth is made up of three different kinds of materials. Now I'm saying three because bone often adheres to the roots of a tooth. But from this table, I hope you can see that the enamel, the dentine and the bone are very different in their composition. Enamel is almost completely inorganic. It only reflects the chemical characteristics of the environment while the tooth was being formed. But from it, we can ascertain information from carbon and from strontium. Dentin is, has a larger organic component. It remodels slightly. And bone is the most organic of the three, and it has ongoing remodeling. So enamel and dentin capture information from the ages when the tooth was forming and bone reflects the situation in the months prior to death. Now, why do we care about these, about these chemical signatures? Because the isotopes of these three state, um, uh, elements give us different information about the, the, about the diet and the environment of the person. The carbon cycle reflects differences in plant metabolism. It can be useful for determining the diet of the person, especially with regard to the sort of grains that were involved, the, the carbohydrate component of the diet. The nitrogen cycle gives us information about the food, what position in the food chain the intake came from. So for example, if you're looking at someone who lived in a on a coastline, the difference between whether they ate shellfish or whether they ate seal meat is huge in terms of where those different animals are on the food chain. And finally, strontium doesn't have to do with diet particularly. It has to do with the, the water that is in the system where the person lives. And the water is going to have a different strontium a signal depending on the type of rock that the soil has developed from. So why do we care about that? Because if the strontium signature of a tooth is different than you would expect in a particular burial environment, then you know that person grew up somewhere else and migrated to that region. So that gives you some some sense of the sort of, of approaches we can use using chemistry. But of course, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention paleogenomics as well, because ancient DNA of the person has become such a major part of bioarchaeology. It's not just of the person, but also of the person's diseases. The best place to find the DNA of a person's microbes is in the pulp cavity of the tooth. The best place for ancient DNA is either in the petrous portions of the temporal bones, illustrated here in the middle picture, or 
this is, I think, really exciting. Some labs are now reporting good results getting ancient DNA from the ear bones. The ear bones are the smallest bones in the human body. They are fully formed at birth. They really don't remodel much. They are quite isolated inside the petrous portions of the temporal bones. And the idea of being able to get a person's DNA out of their ear bones is just, to me, just marvelous. So that's just a very brief background in being an art bio archeologist. So what about curated human remains? You probably don't think about it much, but there are thousands of human skeletons in curation somewhere. And they can be roughly divided into three categories. There are legacy collections that are associated with the long era of what we call race science from the Victorian era to the early 20th century, where measuring skulls would tell us which race they belonged to and, to, and would feed into a view of the world that was very much oriented toward racial hierarchies. And there are many collections that were built around race science. They're mainly skulls, but also postcranial skeletons. There are also anatomical collections. Many medical schools will skeletonize the previously dissected cadavers and keep those skeletons for research purposes. These are mainly unclaimed bodies or bodies of, of very, very poor people. Um, but in some cases they are uh, donated or gifted by people in life uh, to be used for medical research purposes. And then there are archeological collections that exist not so much in med medical schools or museums, but rather in departments of anthropology and archeology, span um, government agencies responsible for archeological mitigation, um, private companies that do archeology span as a business. There are lots of archeological span collections. So the complexity of where they're held is part of the challenge to repatriation because the people responsible for these collections have such different backgrounds and different priorities. So now I'd like to shift over and give you some examples of repatriation with objects and then with bones. I'm going to go through four case studies very briefly. We could probably do a quiz and I'll bet many of you could, rec could identify these four items just from here, but I'll go through them one by one. One of the most interesting or most well-documented examples of uh, repatriation or mitigation of a stolen object is the portrait of Adele Blockbauer. If you saw the 2015 film, Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren as the aggrieved descendant, um, you're familiar with this case. This painting was stolen by the Nazis in 1941. And it certainly wasn't the only thing stolen. Hundreds, maybe thousands of objects were taken by the Nazis. Uh, it was one of the motivations behind the development of the UNESCO Convention. And I want to spend a moment talking about the UNESCO Convention because it's relevant to everything I talk about from this point onward. The full name of the UNESCO Convention is the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transport of Ownership of Cultural Property which is why we just call it the convention. Um, its aspirations are uh, mirrored in another convention from a group called UNIDRA that deals with the private law relevant to stolen and illegally exported cultural objects. This was a global attempt to begin to deal with the perceived problem of stolen materials in curated collections. 
I will say that the UNESCO Convention has only been ratified by 140 nations. It has no system of enforcement. It is just a kind of good measure. Nevertheless, it was one of the factors that led to the successful uh, suit for the return of the painting from, the, from Austria to the descendant. The descendant had the painting transferred to the Los Angeles County Museum in 2006. And it marks the beginning of a very common practice today of galleries scrutinizing their accessions, especially from 1933 to 1945 for signs of Nazi taint. So that was a success. Now we move to what has been not a success to date. And that has to do with what are known as the Elgin marbles, or some would refer to the Parthenon marbles. These were uh, friezes that were systematically removed by the seventh Earl of Elgin, a man named Thomas Bruce, between 1801 and 1812. He removed them from from the Parthenon under very questionable authority. And then he presented them to the British Parliament as objects for sale. He felt, he anticipated that the, the upper class of Britain would ve be very, very pleased that he had taken these things. In fact, they weren't all that pleased. Uh, Lord Byron was one of the people who was very negative about the purchase. Nevertheless, the British Parliament did purchase the Elgin marbles, and they were placed in the British Museum. To me, one of the saddest things about this story was that these things were painted and a curator decided they would look more classical, more elegant if the paint were removed. And so they removed the paint. Gee, anyway, Greece has been trying to get these things back since 1832. In 2009, they built a new museum for them and left a nice big room vacant so that the Elgin marbles could be moved right in. They were discussed during the Brexit negotiations, but to date, they still are in the British Museum. And there's a wonderful 2019 book uh, by Robertson about this particular case. And finally, the third object I want to mention, because it too has been in the news quite a bit, are the Benin bronzes. They were, again, systematically pillaged. In fact, in this case, they, it was a form of punishment to try to destroy Benin City in 1897. Benin, you may be familiar with the country of Africa called Benin, but that's not where the kingdom of Benin was. It's actually in Northern Nigeria. And hundreds of bronzes, objects of art were removed by the British and were distributed to institutions around Europe and North America. They said that there are about 50 pieces in Nigeria Nigeria has not been lobbying for their return with much vigor, not like Greece at all, in part because they really didn't feel they were prepared to receive them and to properly curate them. However, very recently uh, in April, Germany announced through, through the Humboldt Forum, the new development in, in Germany, Germany has announced that it will return at least some of its Benin bronzes to Nigeria. And they are intended to be held at the Edo Museum of West African Art once it is built, which will take until 2025. So they're making progress on not only the return, but also the curation once they've been returned. If you want to know more about the Benin Bronzes, a very new book called The Brutish Museums uh, focuses on the bronzes with a strong message of just give everything back. So now finally, the fourth case study I want to talk about has to do with bones. And it is very Canadian 
I want to introduce you to these two Beothic individuals from Newfoundland who ended up in Scotland. Damestuit was kidnapped in 1819. The, the picture that you see here is a miniature watercolor that was done on ivory by a British uh, woman during the year when she was held by these people who kidnapped her. Her husband, Nomas Nosabasset, Nosabasset, was killed during his resistance to her kidnapping. Now her husband was left behind among the Baothic, the small group of Baothic who still existed at that time. And he was buried in the traditional fashion, which among the Baothic meant being put in a hut above ground. Demistuit died reportedly of tuberculosis in 1820. Her body was returned to where they'd found her and he, she was buried with her husband. So all that happened on the map here in Newfoundland. In 1827, a young man, a Newfoundlander who had been educated in Scotland took the skulls and some grave goods and sent them to his professor at the University of Edinburgh. And then they were put into the University Museum. In, as you know, I'm sure the Beothic are considered culturally extinct. In about 2012, the Mi'kmaq requested the return of these crania and the Scottish Parliament said no. Then all indigenous groups of Newfoundland and Labrador joined in the request and the Scottish Parliament said no. Then all indigenous groups were joined by the government of Canada and Scotland said, okay, we will return these crania to the government of Canada. So in 2012, the skulls moved from Edinburgh to Ottawa. And then in later in 2020, the skulls moved from Ottawa back to Newfoundland. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not exactly sure what's happened since. I'm not sure what the intention is in Newfoundland of what will be done with the crania, but they have now been at least returned to the right geographic location. So that gives you some sense of the sorts of challenges and contexts that occur with regard to both objects and human remains. I'm gonna back up just a tiny bit here to talk about the word repatriation and what the uh, legal framework is on a global level. Repatriation comes from the Greek word for homeland, which means that it's actually not a gendered word. I've started to see some written material talking about repatriation and rematriation. That's not necessary. It's a neut neutral, it's a non-gendered word. S many countries prefer to use the word restitution if the transfer is occurring within a single country rather than moving from one country to another. The word refers to transfer of responsibility. It does not, it, we associate it with burial, but it doesn't have to be associated with burial. The responsible, the responsible party can decide what to do after the repatriation occurs. Many people are familiar with the federal legislation in the United States called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And indeed, many people that I chat with think that NAGPRA applies to the whole world, and it certainly doesn't. It's just an American law, but it has had a steering effect in many ways. Australia and New Zealand both have Aboriginal repatriation federal laws as well, but most countries have no legislation. In Canada, for example, Heritage is a provincial responsibility, 
and each province has heritage legislation, but there is no federal legislation that speaks to restitution or repatriation of human remains. And the UNESCO Convention and many other policy statements do not mention human remains. For example, the International Council of Museums has a very firm and wonderful statement in their code of ethics, but it doesn't talk about human remains. In fact, I think it's worth, I'm gonna actually read this because it is really an aspirational document that um, people in, in curation contexts, I think take quite seriously. Museums should be prepared to initiate dialogue for the return of cultural property to a country or people of origin. This should be undertaken in an impartial manner based on scientific, professional, and humanitarian principles, as well as applicable local, national, and international legislation in preference to action at a governmental or political level. In other words, the International Council of Museum is suggesting that institutions should undertake restitution and repatriation voluntarily without having a big government stick hanging over their head. This has been undertaken by many activities done by the Commonwealth Association of Museums. And there is movement in this regard. Nevertheless, there are museums like the British Museum that I mentioned previously, in which national legislation specifically prohibits the deaccessioning of anything. So, and all of this leaves the non-museum repositories like departments of anthropology, for example, at loose ends. So now we move to my, my spiel, my position. My position is that just like objects, human remains should be documented now there's a tendency for people to say, well, if these skulls have been sitting in a museum for a hundred years, surely they've been documented. Well, no, they haven't. They've been measured. They've been measured, they've been classified, they've been placed into racial categories, but the actual humanity of the, of the human that donated that skull has not been interrogated. The story of humanity is in part encapsulated in these collections and we have ways to we have ways to get at that now so repatriation and restitution is actually an opportunity for scholars and scientists to support the decolonization of the narrative of the past a level leveling the playing field, so to speak, through the development of osteobiographies, biographical stories of the people whose remains are available to us in these collections, and then making a plan for the appropriate curation or reburial or handling of those remains going forward. Whether it's reasonable to think about this on a systematic level, I'm not sure, but we need to have revised approaches that convey respect and generate facts because although there is a lot of, of subjective feeling associated with these topics, there is also science. So now finally, I want to give you an example of a repatriation activity that is underway, almost complete. It takes place at the University of Cape Town Medical School. And uh, there's a little map I'm going to be, uh, the actual repatriation is in Sutherland, which as you can see is in the interior of the country. I'm going to give you the very brief storyline and then I'm going to show you a video. So the story of the Sutherland skeletons is that in the 1920s, a medical student 
from a Sutherland farm presented his anatomy professor with nine skeletons that he dug up on his family's land. These were the skeletons of indentured farm workers. They were indigenous people of the region, namely the Khoisan, uh, sometimes called Bushmen. This was very interesting to the professor because of the focus on race science at the moment, at that time. These were recent deaths, many of whom were known by name. So these were handed to the professor with names attached. In 2017, a young new anatomy professor said, this is not good and proposed returning them. The university agreed. The professor traveled to Sutherland with an interpreter to meet the family. And the families decided they wanted to know everything they could about their relatives. So the University of Cape Town put together a team, including an archeologist, a historian, a chemist to do stable isotope analysis, a paleogenomics lab, and a facial reconstruction lab. There's an interesting spin in order to de develop the background to these skeletons before they were returned. There's a little glitch in the story, and that is that there was a family from the Eastern Cape, far, far, far from Sutherland, who had the same last name, and they challenged the presumed genealogy. But in fact, the stable isotopes confirmed that the skeletons' lives had been spent on the Northern Cape, not the Eastern Cape. So that's the, that's the very brief background, and now I hope I'm going to show you a video. The area around Sutherland in the Northern Cape is rich in heritage and history, but this is where a serious injustice was done. The remains of San and Khoi people were removed from their resting place on the Kreisrefeer farm near Sutherland in the 1920s and brought to the University of Cape Town. UCT realized that they were unethically acquired while doing an audit of its skeletal collection in February 2017. This finding presents a transformational moment for us as an institution. A moment in which we acknowledge and apologize unreservedly for an institutional mistake. A process led by UCT Deputy Vice Chancellor for Transformation, Professor Loretta Ferris, was set up to see how the remains could be returned to their rightful place and laid to rest near their families. Removing people from their grave, from their resting place, is a major impact on, on their humanity and on their dignity. And so bringing them back, reburying them, putting them back in their resting place, and in a way, putting their souls to rest, is for us a way of trying to restore the dignity. With the help of a public participation consultant, the descendants were traced. When I shared with them the project, they were stunned. First, they were shocked because especially the Stearman family, they didn't know uh, about what happened to their family. And they always wondered for years what happened to their family. And here we're coming, UCT is coming to tell them their story. I had long time for this moment. Because I had a lot of people who 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 had a lot a team of scientists from across various disciplines work together to establish the identity of the individuals, provide insights into where they lived, their diet and their living conditions. They were able to reconstruct their faces as they would have appeared at the time of death. They were able to determine their gender, height and estimate ages, establish any medical conditions they had and cause of deaths and determine their genetic relationship. The team also conducted a survey of the Kreisrefeer Farm Cemetery they had originally been buried at, did an in-depth analysis of the disturbed graves, and examined the history of the farm of the Rochefeld area. During the year, there were several cultural exchanges between the San, Khoi, and University community. 
It was a significant moment when the scientific findings were shared with the Abram and Stierman families and the facial reconstructions of their ancestors revealed. We were so excited. I think it's just excitement that couldn't lead me to sleep. Mm -hmm. Because every time when I close my eyes, I start seeing all these pictures, the faces in front of me. And at the end of the, the day, I had them all each of them singing for me a song, a gospel song. It is no hals for me a great year om te kan sien en elkeen vertel vir my a story op sy eie. En ek en as ek sien vir Sarki en dit is nogal baie emotioneel, maar ek is bly. The groundbreaking research could influence national policy on restitution and be precedent setting internationally. For the UCT team, the process has been extremely meaningful. The impact of what we're doing is bigger than reburying nine people. We're rebuilding a history that is lost in this community. And for me, that is an incredible privilege to be part of. Notionally, we know what transformation means, uh, but this is an, uh, a tangible example which uh, people can look to for, uh, for inspiration. So I'm very happy to have been part of that. Addressing past injustices through redress and restitution has been at the heart of this process. And it is hoped it will bring a sense of peace and healing to the Abram and Stierman families and to the greater community around Sutherland. Oops, um, there we go, back to, now I'm confused, one, 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 there, all right. And that's it. I can now um, stop sharing screen. <laughs>